Okay, we're gonna get started. Good afternoon. I'm Judy Wasserheit, and I am delighted to welcome you uh, to what promises to be one of the most thought-provoking sessions at this CUGH conference, because together with our panel of some of the most insightful people in global health, in my humble opinion, um, we are going to be reimagining global health in the 21st century. Um, let me give you a little bit of a sense of why we're here. A little bit about the backstory. About 15 years ago, as we were forming the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, we realized that there actually was no consensus definition about this emerging field of global health, and that seemed a little bit problematic. So, led by Jeff Copeland, a former CDC director, we wrote a Lancet paper titled, Toward a Common Definition of Global Health. Um, <clears throat> in that paper, we contrasted global health with international health and public health, um, and as a means to stimulate discussion in the global health community and beyond, we propose the following definition. I'm gonna quote from that paper. Global health is an area for study, research, and practice that places priority on improving health and achieving equity in health for all people worldwide. This was in it was published in uh, 2009. Global health emphasizes transnational health issues, determinants, and solutions. It involves many disciplines within and beyond health sciences, promotes interdisciplinary collaboration, and is a synthesis of population-based prevention with individual-level clinical care. Over the years, uh, many others have added their thoughts. But today, I think one thing we can all agree on is that we've seen tremendous changes during the last two decades since global health first really emerged as an academic field. We've seen changes in the drivers, the tools, the approaches, and the conceptual foundations of global health. We've seen tectonic shifts in um, demographics, geopolitical shifts, economic shifts. We've seen dramatic improvements in health systems and services in some places, accelerated by advances in health and information technologies, while other communities have been left behind. All of that has resulted in major increases in disparities, many of which have been thrown into relief by, uh, by COVID. At the same time, there finally seems to be growing recognition of the need to address some truly global challenges like climate change and pandemic diseases. And equity and decolonization have gained much more traction as critical concepts in global health. So in the context of all of these changes, we think it's time for the global health community, that would be for us, all of us, to take a really clear-eyed, fresh, honest look at ourselves, look at our field, um, to at least ask whether we should redefine or refine and reimagine global health for the current era and into the future. So we're convening this plenary to launch that inquiry, um, to ask the question of what is global health in the 21st century. Um, as we said in that Lancet paper, you know, the truth is if we do not clearly define what we mean by global health, we can't possibly reach agreement on what we're trying to achieve, the approaches we have to take, the skills that are needed, and very importantly, the ways that we should use resources. So it's pretty important that we figure out what we mean by global health and how it's changed. So with all of that, let me introduce the terrific people that um, you see up here with me. 
First, my wonderful co-moderators are Maureen Litchfield, uh, who is Dean of the School of Public Health and Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health at the University of Pittsburgh, and who currently chairs our CUGH board. The other, my other co-moderator is uh, Peter Kilmarks, who is the acting director of the NIH's Fogarty International Center. He's a Rear Admiral and Assistant Surgeon General in the U.S. Public Health Services, Service, and he has held multiple leadership positions at CDC, including as the CDC Country Director in Zimbabwe. And our very distinguished panelists, they are Hamid Ahmed, um, who is the Executive Director of the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh, ICDDRB, Professor of pu um, Public Health Nutrition at BRAC University in Bangladesh, and um, very fortunately for us, an affiliate professor of global health at the University of Washington. Um, Ala Alwan is professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and also an affiliate professor at the University of Washington. He is a former uh, WHO regional director for the Eastern Mediterranean region and former Minister of Health and Minister of Education in Iraq. Um, Patricia Garcia is a professor and former dean of the Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia um, an affiliate professor at the University of Washington. She's former Minister of Health uh, in Peru. And Melissa Salm is a postdoctoral fellow um, at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University and a really wonderful thought leader on our CUGH Research Committee and in our CUGH community writ large. We were also scheduled to have a fifth panelist, um, and I'm very disappointed that she is not able to join us. That's Agnes Binoajo, the founder and former vice chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity um, and former minister of health in Rwanda. And unfortunately, Agnes uh, let us know uh, late Monday that she will not would not be able to join us here in person, and I, I really regret that. Um, but now, uh, before we dive uh, in with our questions for our panelists, Dr. Lichfeld and Dr. Kilmarks are going to add their welcomes. So please, Maureen. Welcome. As you know, nothing that um, Dr. Wasserheitz puts together is not, is not successful. It's a double negative, so it must be a positive. So thank you, Dr. Wasserheit. Um, it is my honor to provide some welcoming remarks at the beginning of our panel. You should know that the planning of this panel, of this plenary, has gone on for many, many months. And so what is it that we should be looking forward to? We should be looking forward to building on the debate this morning how equity fits into global health. What should be or should there be a return on investment in global health? How does One Health fit in global health? Who should benefit from global health? And should that reciprocity of benefit between high income and low income countries and among low income countries? Should there be health and global health? Should there be global and health? What should it be? And so all of these questions we will interrogate during this panel. So welcome, and we are all looking forward to a very healthy uh, debate to come. Thank you. So I'm just going to, is this on? Can you, is it working? OK, so it's not on. Can you hear me now? Yeah. OK. So I'm just going to say uh, briefly that the other hat I've now uh, taken on is as the Acting Associate Director for International Research at NIH. And it's our role for Fogarty to support 
and encourage the other 26 institutes and centers in their international global health research activities. So this question is very important for me and for Fogarty that we're supposed to be, we're the Wayne Gretzky's, we're supposed to know where the puck is going and we provide the guidance and the encouragement and as a, a catalyzing force for the other institutes and centers at NIH. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion and happy to have Judy and Maureen um, are both, uh, we're together on the research committee for CUGH, but they're both also advisory board members for Fogarty. Okay, well thank you both. Um, so I, I'd like to start with um, an initial round of very brief, like two minute uh, opening comments from each of you, each of our panelists. Um, as in, in response to two sort of yin-yang questions, as you think about the multiple profound changes that we've just listed um, and that have occurred since the field of global health uh, emerged, on the one hand, what keeps you up at night um, now and as you look toward the future? And then the flip side, on the other hand, what are two aspects of global health that at all costs we need to preserve and continue with? And Tamid, do you want to lead off? We can just go around. Thank you. Uh, I live and work in Bangladesh. And you can imagine with some of my colleagues present here in this audience, what it means to face you know, the different facets of global health almost on a day-to-day -day basis. And that keeps us awake on many of the nights. So when you asked me the question, Dr. Wasser Hyde, I think the two most important elements of global health that come to our mind are in fact embedded in the very nice article that you wrote for The Lancet. And the two elements to me happen to be none other than geographic reach. Global health is such that it should transcend national boundaries. That's very, very important. The other thing that's very important to me and my colleagues is access to health. And when I talk about access to health, the element of equity comes into play. If we can't have equity, if we can't remove, or if we can't combat inequity, then I think the very purpose of doing work in global health is not reached or sustained. So these are the two very important elements to me. Thank you. That's a great kickoff. Allah, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, engaging me in this very interesting panel. I, um, I, I have three things that actually worry me about global health and the work in, in global health. My first concern uh, is that uh, the many of the main global health problems that we currently face are not being adequately uh, addressed. And so we are now far from being prepared for pandemics, emergency response. We are not track on many of the SDG targets, and we only have seven years to go to 2030. We're not on track in relation to universal health coverage. Uh, half of the population, world population, have no access, almost. We are not on track on the global commitments for non-communicable diseases. We're not on track on climate change. Uh, and we are still struggling with the very high maternal mortality and, and, and child mortality. I think we have the right vision. Uh, I think global health also has roadmaps, sound roadmaps to address uh, these issues. But there are major impediments. And, and, and I think the global health community as well as countries are not able to address them uh, effectively. So that's one of the main concerns. The second concern is that I believe that 
there are some gaps in the global health governance that have to be uh, addressed as soon as possible. And so global health governance has to improve. Uh, there are certain aspects that are currently weak. The global health uh, institutions, at least some of them are poorly financed, are too bureaucratic, subject to influences, uh, and these are key issues that need to be uh, reconsidered. And the third concern is very much related to low and middle income countries, including my own country. Uh, I, I, I worry that you know, many of these countries are not adequately engaged in global health discussions. I have been in WHO for about 24 years, attending global health uh, meetings, executive board, World Health Assembly, and it's sad to see that many uh, countries uh, are not, do not really have the skills to participate in global health discussions that very much relate to the situation uh, uh, in their own country. And then the second question, what are the two critical issues uh, that we, you know, we should always return? I think one is the role of global health in, in one of the most important uh, uh, global health issue today, and that is pandemics, emergency preparedness and response. And I think the second one is, is um, the need for more effective uh, cooperation uh, uh, in low and middle income countries, particularly in health system strengthening. I worry a lot about the kind of technical support and technical assistance that we give to countries. I think that, that there is a need for a new model for technical cooperation in countries that can be more effective in addressing these ones. Thank you. Those are wonderful comments. Thank you, Ella. Patty, please. Well, first of all, thank you so much. And actually, probably if you look at my face, you will see that I haven't slept very well last night because I was thinking about the lots of things that worried me and, and actually, yeah, so I decided to list them, okay? So the first thing that least that comes to my mind regarding global health and worries me are the asymmetries of power that we are still seeing. It has improved. Okay, I cannot say that it hasn't. But still, the asymmetry of power is not allowing, for example, to empower the local actors. And that is something that probably we're gonna be working later on. Um, and this asymmetry of power is also making us, and I, I, I mean include, I'm including myself in this community of global health people, or people that are interested in global health, is that we end up seeing, probably almost always, the countries in the north as the saviors, okay? Like everything comes from the north. Second, the asymmetry of funding. And that goes, and that has to do not only with research that we're gonna be discussing later on, but um, on all the things that happen, even a global NGOs, uh, most of the funding that is supposed to go to our countries for issues that had to do with, with problems in our countries, overheads and the other money, I mean, go back and recycle to the countries that are giving the money. So there are, there are lots of things about asymmetry of the funding that need to be discussed. Number three is this issue of over medicalized, the over medicalized nature of global health as we are seeing. Mainly, we are thinking about biomedical solutions in most of the things that we discuss in global health, unfortunately, okay? And we ignore that there are other disciplines and actually global health is not going to be solved just with a health people and with these type of solutions. Number four is that I think we are, um, we are being too superficial in most of the things that we are doing, okay? We are not going into the root causes. And um, I, I heard in one of the sessions when they were talking about, for example, One Health and prevention, right? We need to think about prevention at the source. Okay? What is causing these things? And interventions at the source going deeper. We are not, and, and sometimes people 
fear about the word political, but I mean, unless we deal with those issues, with political, with social actions, we're not gonna do the changes that we need. Five, <laughs> um, I think we are, and this is an English word that I learned, okay, and exists because I saw it in the dictionary. I think in global health, we are being monism, monistic, which means that we think just about health instead of being pluralistic, okay? We are not including all the disciplines that we need to be included, okay? I'm not gonna ask, I mean, there are some lawyers I know, but I would wish there were architects here, for example. I mean, there are so many issues that are surrounding health and global health that we need lots of disciplines helping us. And there is this other issue. I love the definition that, that I mean, I, I still the definition, for me, the definition of global health that you read about is perfect. And there are several definitions that are perfect. But the problem is that what it means to you, to me, to institutions, to a citizen, that's where the problem is, okay? There are different meanings. And um, for funding agencies, maybe global health means those countries that need money because they are poor. Uh, unfortunately, global health and departments of global health or programs of global health sometimes mean tourism agencies for students. And sorry, but I'm trying to be honest, and that happens. So those are the kind of things that are really keeping me up at night. And um, I hope that at least saying it, I mean, up loud, we can start thinking about solutions. And the last one, because this is something that I, I talk about, I'm concerned about corruption also, okay? Because it exists and it's there and we are not doing much in that area because everybody hates and fears the word, that word with a C. I stop there. Thank you. Hopefully after this plenary, you'll sleep better tonight, huh? Thank you. Mel, please. Okay, okay. what keeps me up at night? Um, general anxiety um, and, and occasionally getting s too sucked into TikTok. Um, but in the context of this panel, um, I, I, worry about the, the decision-making of things. Um, so who decides what a global health priority is or should be? Uh, what, which risks are most relevant? Which techno, excuse me, technical solutions to pursue? And uh, which analysis frameworks to use? Um, you know, is, do we, is, are we looking at uh, cost effectiveness, uh, return on investment? Um, are we driven by equity? How would we even measure that? Do we have frameworks for measuring when equity has been achieved? Um, who gets a seat at the table? Um, I just I, I want decision making in global health not to be divorced from the real lived experiences of people from different parts of the world. Um, and I have, I'm a little nervous too about some of the tensions between all of the, the, the objectives and the ideals that we say. So we want to innovate but, and, and drive and participate in the knowledge economy, but we also want to decolonize um, uh, institutions and, and of knowledge production. Um, we also we want to deliver care, but we also want to protect national security. And so sometimes these things feel intention, and so the question of who decides what we pursue feels very, very meaningful to me. Um, in terms of what to keep, I would say the money. <laughs> and then um, also, also, the idea, I would keep the idea that science is political. 
Um, we heard this a lot during the COVID-19 pandemic that, oh, the science got politicized. Coming from a background in uh, medical anthropology, science and technology studies, and from a history of science point of view, um, social scientists have been saying for uh, 50 or 60 years now that uh, science is political, always has been, and always will be. The fact that any government funds uh, science is already political. What we decide to do with scientific evidence once we have it, that's a political decision. Um, and insofar as scientific evidence supports public health, which is an applied science in the service of the state, that regulates the movements of bodies and uh, intervenes into the daily lives of people, it's also political. So I don't think saying that science is politicized or public health is political, it, this is not a bad thing, it's just true. Thank you. I'm glad you called us on that, that last point especially. So, all right, that's a great introduction to um, to our discussion. Maureen, I'm going to turn this to you for the next round of questions, huh? And Please. We'll switch places. Yeah. Please switch places. So each of you, um, perhaps not so much knowingly, um, has switched transitions as nicely in this first round. So in the next 15 minutes, um, I have one question and several sub-questions for our distinguished panel. What makes something a global health issue? It's the overarching question. What are the most important characteristics of a global health issue? What do we mean by global and what do we mean by health? And is there a place, a room, a growth in health versus global? And then lastly, do you think that the definition of global health differs from the past in the 21st century? So all of that encompassed in this one question about what makes something a global health issue? Mel, what makes something a global health issue? Okay, uh, well, I'm gonna pick up on the subtopic of what is, what is the global in global health and what is health in global health? Because I really like that way of dialectically looking at these two terms and um, conceptualizing each of them and then defining them in relation to each other. So coming from a background in anthropology, uh, for me, health is so much more than the absence of disease. Um, it is biological, but it is also social, political, and economic. Health is a condition for life. Um, and that, and that is conditioned by forces that influence the particular context and situations in which people live and, 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 and the knowledges that they produce. Um, in that sense, health, our, our capacity for health and the, our vulnerability to disease, is, it's inherited. Again, not just biologically, but locally, uh, historically and systemically. Um, so I just wanna, like, for an example, I, I did my field work as a Fogarty Fellow uh, th throughout Peru, and one of the field sites was in, the, um, in Piura, uh, in northern Peru, where people live amidst endemic neurocystic sarcosis. Um, so their health is contingent upon the existence of parasites, the way they interact with pigs, whether or not they've received educational resources from local community workers or from global health teams um, on how to, on, on hygiene, uh, or, but mostly like whether or not they have a toilet. Um, so if I were there, my health would be affected by a complex situation that's informed by legacies of colonialism and racism and ongoing state neglect, as well as my place in a zoonotic disease ecology. So if we think about health in this more complex way, then it makes it clearer, at least for me, to then conceptualize the global as 
yes, in the global and global health, there are transnational and territorial dimensions, but also I think it alludes to the multiplicity of influences upon, upon health. Um, so I, I, I see it global in a more holistic sense, more so than anything else. So I see Tamit grabbing the microphone. So Tamit, what are the three, four, five characteristics of a global health issue, or are there any? I think when I think about global health, the number one uh, characteristic that comes to my mind is the burden. If you want to ascribe to a particular condition the term global health, the burden should be substantial. And this burden should you know, cross boundaries. So that's a very important characteristic, okay? If not global, at least it should be regional, covering several populations. And for each of these conditions, we need to have interventions, okay? At least there should be an aspirational goal to come up with interventions. Otherwise, why should we work for global health? We need to see that the people who suffer, they have these interventions reached out to them. The risk factors of such conditions should also be regional, if not global. So that's also an important attribute. But when we talk about all these things, you know, the previous speakers have mentioned about cost. And I want to, you know, add that, you know, cost is also a major, major driver. If you look at what has happened over the last several years, you know, the amount of official development assistance, you would see that it has increased. Increased by how much? By about 5% in 2021 compared to 2020. But if you look at the breakdown, you will see that most of this increase is because of the costs, subsidies for covid vaccine. Very important, it's because of these COVID vaccine subsidies that, you know, maybe we are healthy today, but if you remove the amount that was spent for COVID-19 vaccine, the increase in 2021 compared to 2020 is only a fraction, 0.6 percent. So we are talking about huge magnitude of global health problems and that's on the increase. The population is increasing, but yet the funds, the resources available are not. They are staying almost at the same level. You also asked a question as to what we would be the perception of people in our countries regarding global health. I think it was Dr. Alawan who mentioned that, you know, people usually in our part of the world, they don't have a clear conception about global health. And that's true. Whatever conception is that, I would say, unfortunately, that's very self-centered. People, we tend to believe that global health is such which is going to do quite substantial harm to our population, but we are going to solve it with the support, with the efforts of people in other countries. We hardly realize that global health is something that also affects people living in middle-income and high-income countries. I think I'll stop here, Maureen. Thank you. And that naturally transitions me to Patty. So Patty, does global health is often seen as a high-income country term, are there differences and what are the differences for lower and middle-income countries when I say we do global health? Yeah, and um, actually I just want also to, to, to comment one thing. I might um, be a little in a position, I'm not sure if burden should be considered one of those things that to define something global or not, okay? 
Um, sometimes we there are things that we are not counting because countries don't have the, the possibility of counting those things and we ignore the burden. Or things like monkeypox gets ignored because it's in only one country and we're not considering the possibility. And it becomes important only when somebody in the US or in high income countries gets the disease. So I think we have to be careful. It's a word of caution about burden. I was thinking more that something could be global if um, we can think about models sharing cooperative solutions that could help to intervene and to solve those problems, okay? And regarding the issue of how do we see in countries like mine uh, or, or in, in, in low middle income countries global health. So let's try to think just about one thing, okay? Most of the programs of global health are located in high income countries. If you count in South America, my university has a master's in public health and global health, okay? And we have an undergraduate program in global health, but actually I'm fighting with the, with the uh, provost because actually they think that we should not have global health programs because global health is a construct of high income countries. Okay, so, and, and at some point, I mean, it's like when, when the, in the first discussions about global health, I remember, I mean, everything was like, okay, let's try to work in Bangladesh, in Africa, or in other countries. So I said, like, but I work in global health, and I believe that, I believe I work in global health because I'm trying to find a models sharing cooperative ways of solving problems, and I know that this ha are, had to do with diseases that can cross, are crossing already borders or can cross borders, right? And I don't need to look for countries that are southern to me to say that I'm doing global health. So there is, although the definition says what it's, it's there, the fact that there are very few and somebody was giving some statistics, I think, counting the number of global health programs. There are very few in South America. I think I count two or three programs, and that's it. And most of the programs are in high-income countries. So that means that people are not getting the concept of global health. And that is an issue that you wanted to address. I mean, do we need the word global? Are we really touching what we should do. We are ignoring also the aspects, because that's another thing. We are talking about humans, but now we know how important is the interaction of humans, environment, and animals. But um, should we use the word planetary health? But you know, I was doing a survey around my colleagues in Peru, and said like, what do you think about planetary health? And they were saying like, um, well, that sounds like um, UFO, right? UFO? <laughs> it doesn't sound like that, like Martians. And so it, we are going from humans in the middle. So, and when glo and global health, it's only like what high income countries are doing in well, low income countries. Well, um, I, I don't know. Uh, let's see what the audience thinks. Who will win this fight about global health? The provost or Patty? I'll let you answer that question. Um, the last um, feedback in this round is, is from um, Ala. Ala, so given all that, would the definition differ of global health in the 21st century? Or should it differ? Uh, I don't think it differs. Uh, I think, I mean, I, I fully agree with the Lancet definition. I think it's an excellent definition. Uh, but I like to simplify it. I think, I think global health uh, is uh, is, is when an issue transcends national boundaries. And slightly disagreeing with uh, my friend Patty, uh, I think also global health is when uh, an issue uh, becomes significant at the regional level or the uh, 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 global level. So these issues that we currently call global health issues can be social determinants, they can be risks, like environmental risks, behavioral risks, and they can also be conditions or, um, uh, or, or actual health problems, like, for example, pandemic or cancer or uh, 
um, uh, environmental uh, uh, pollution. I think the, term, the terminology is the same. I think more recently, uh, global health is seen, uh, uh, I think, more important. And I think there is a, a number of global health issues that are requiring urgent solutions. And so today, I think we are more aware uh, about the global health issues that 20 years ago or uh, 30 years ago. And there are reasons for this because, uh, you know, and, uh, and actually, it's, it's global health issues are not just uh, issues that are currently discussed with, you know, by the World Health Assembly, by ministers of health. There's now a movement the General Assembly of the United Nations. So, uh, this is not working? Yeah, it's working, yeah. So it's, uh, I think there are now reasons for um, global health becoming more prominent. We are more aware about global health and I think there is also awareness that there is an urgent need for solutions for some of the critical global health issues. Thank you, and now we'll dive deeper in the specific issues of global health, and Peter will moderate that round. Thank you, Maureen, and we'll now get into round two of our questions. And this is where we do want to dive deeper into some of these key factors that are really driving changes in the field of, of global health. The overarching question is how should these forces reshape the field of global health as we think about uh, changes in the 21st century. And we'll start with um, Tamid. So we're in an era of global health crises. Climate change, pandemic threats, demographic changes, migration. You, you have the perspective as a clinician, a research leader, an expert in pediatrics, nutrition, diarrheal disease. How do you see these compounding crises reshaping the field of global health? Uh, thank you, Peter. I think I will, I will uh, start with two specific examples. One is, of course, cholera, and the other is food insecurity. Last year, in Dhaka, we faced the greatest cholera epidemic in the history of ICD-DRB, and perhaps in the history of the country. Okay. Now, we tackled it, and one thing that we did, which was unique, never done in the past, was mobilizing, mobilizing the government of Bangladesh as well as the World Health Organization. So ICDDRB knew what to do, assisted the government of Bangladesh, set out a reactive application to the World Health Organization, and then the WHO respond, responded positively. And you know, in a record three months time, a population of 2.5 million people in the hot spots of Dhaka city were given the two shots of oral cholera vaccine in just three months, two and a half million people. Now, this is a successful, you know, event. Do we know that today, when we are speaking in this auditorium, epidemics of cholera rage in as many as 10 countries, but there are no vaccines. Oral cholera vaccine, much of the research was done in Bangladesh at ICD-DRB, such a wonderful tool, but stock out, okay? So much so that instead of the two doses, People are not thinking whether just one dose would suffice. So in this era where, Peter, you have talked about technology, don't we think that we should overcome all the hurdles and you know, expedite the certification process, all these things, accreditation process, so that pharmaceutical countries in other countries, they can also start producing this oral cholera vaccine in bulk. And this is possible. Just within one and a half years, we have learned about COVID. We have 
invented the COVID vaccine, we have mass produced it, and we have vaccinated you know, millions and millions of people. If we can do it for COVID-19, why not for cholera? Cholera also kills people. The other thing, as an example, that I would like to place before you, Peter, is food insecurity. Do we know today that, you know, close to 800 million people today are food insecure? They go to bed hungry, and many of that is translated into maternal as well as childhood undernutrition. And this is happening in an era where we are at the best in terms of technology, and yet this is happening. Does that mean that the world is producing less amounts of food? The answer is no. We are producing enough. The problem is of inequity. And of course, we also need to find out how we can achieve the same nutritional value by using foods, specially designed, articulated food that can give the same or even better nutritional uh, uh, benefit. So these are the things that come to my mind when you say that there is technology, yes, but again, because of the things that we have not been able to do so, do far, technology is yet to come to the rescue of these millions of people. Millions of people suffering from very simple diseases such as cholera and then, of course, food insecurity. Yeah. Th thanks, Tamid. And it's striking that we're also facing a global crisis of obesity at the same time with the food insecurity. So you've queued up technology as a solution, and I'm going to turn to Patty that we are in this era of remarkable technological progress everything ranging from genomics to artificial intelligence and machine learning. So in your experience, clinician, researcher, educator, former health minister, what do you think the main effects of these technological developments will be on our concept of global health going forward? Okay, well, there is no doubt that, um, for example, artificial intelligence is going to be transformational in healthcare. There are so many promises about how um, this type of advances can uh, improve treatment, monitoring, rehabilitation. I was uh, sharing with, uh, with Judy that for the very first time, for example, there are a, a group of, actually one of my students of uh, graduated from medical informatics, working with others, they are bringing this type of technology for rehabilitation in Peru, okay? So um, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible all the things that could happen. However, I think we need to take that into account, but we have also to um, watch and be able to measure what will be that the impact that it will have in on the people, on the systems, and on the societies. We don't know yet. Um, the same way as with other technologies, okay? But we have all kind of things like um, incubators. If um, those are not adapted for the needs of the countries, they may not be helpful. I remember we um, created the opportunity for developers of different technologies to come to Peru. And I brought them to areas in the coast, in the Andean, and in the, in the Andes, and in the jungle, to see what were the realities of the health services, OK? And I remember we were in Puno, where the Lake Titicaca is, and we went to this health center. And uh, what was really interesting for the developers was there was a young woman that just had a baby, and she was covered with lots of blankets because it was quite cold. And they were asking, um, what was that table or something that had a little uh, image of a virgin over it? And I said, like, go close and see. And it was an incubator. And, and they were like, why they are not using it? Because this was a donation, and it was an incubator for a place where you need electricity. And there was no electricity at that high altitude. Hmm. 
So we have to be sure that, um, and, and I think that is something that we need to discuss in global health, we need to be sure that these new amazing technologies like artificial intelligence, first of all, do not worsen the gaps that already exist. And that's a critical issue. Not perpetuate or not worsen the gaps. We need to be sure that we have ways of validating their impacts, okay? And to assess that they actually improve health outcomes. The other thing is, with the example of the incubator, we need incubators that could work, first of all, at that high altitude, second, that may work without electricity, and that can feed where we need them to feed. The same way, we have to assure that these technologies are designed by and for the use of local communities. One thing that worries me, and maybe doesn't allow me to sleep well at night, is that for artificial intelligence, in order to work well, you need to have lots of data, okay? And that data should represent almost everybody and all the situations. And right now, there is a disparity because the data that is there is the data that is produced in those countries that produce data. And so it may not represent and it may not give you the results that we need for the countries, I mean, low middle income countries or other countries. And just to, to finish, in the case of genomics, it's so great that with this pandemic, so genomics, it's not something that we can see far away because we know that it may happen in our countries. However, we are far to be using it for other diseases. We are concerned about the availability of supplies and others. We are concerned about the costs. And we need to think regionally, for example, is how can we become, how can we have technology or be technologically independent? So if another pandemic or another thing happened, we don't depend on the other countries to be producing whatever is needed for for uh, laboratories or for the genomics. We want technology. We need to assure that nobody will be left behind. Uh, we need to assure that there will be capacity building and exchange. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And um, I think that those efforts should be, should be discussed now. Yeah. Now that all these technological things are starting to uh, thanks, Patty, and thanks for really important points, and uh, along with Tamit about the importance of being able to actually produce and adapt the technologies w where they're needed, and especially about data science to actually, you know, have the data produ produced and, and shared from the countries where, where those tools will be adaptable. And we don't have the capacity. I mean, creating capacity yeah. also for data science, it's another thing that is needed. Yeah, yeah, terrific. Um, so, Mel, we're putting a lot of burden on you, representing the next generation, um, but as someone who is relatively early in your global health career, what changes do you see are already happening in research methods and in education methods, and what changes do you foresee that will affect the practice of what we call global health? Okay, so a bit more modestly than representing an entire generation of up and coming scholars, I just wanna talk a little bit about my, um, my my personal experience and entry into the field, um, because I think it can also serve as an um, as an example for how the field, for how global health research and education are changing. Um, so, I entered global health as a medical anthropologist through a Fogarty Fellowship. So I'm I never received training in epidemiology or, or medicine or, or, or global health, not in any formal sense. I. I I learned how to do global health research by, by doing it and with the support of mentors. Um, but basically what doing anthropology in the field of global health, what that means is I was able to do a rigorous, uh, empirically grounded um, inquiry into concepts such as global and health and contagion and the pathogen and the human. Uh, and to interrogate all of these by talking to people in global health, um, listening to their points of view, their voices, also listening to the pigs and to the parasites. 
Um, my methodological toolkit was informed by advances uh, coming out of contemporary anthropology, but also um, from One Health and, and some of the conceptual innovations there. Um, I think that's a huge difference like in the 21st century uh, for me is, is the, the impact of One Health, um, which probably many of you already are familiar with, but is guided by the, the belief that human health, animal health, and in environmental health are inextricably uh, interconnected um, and, and mutually, mutually interdependent, and that, you can, and that health becomes a more than human problem. Um, so for me, this gave me a way into decentering the human in order to rethink global health. And something that I noticed is that it's really hard for people in global health to get beyond the human. I, I, think, we're in, I think it has to do with incentives, like we get funded and we have to improve human health. Um, there's, there's increasing awareness that human health is is, is, is also more than human health, but then when it comes to the types of solutions and interventions that end up getting implemented, it's very much still very focused on the human. Um, I wanted to say one more thing. You asked about global health as a practice, uh, and I don't know what global health as a practice is. Um, I think that in practice, Global health is public health, um, I th but with new global funding mechanisms. Um, I've heard this a lot from people when I was uh, all over Latin America. They're like, it's, it's what we've been doing. It's what we do. Um, so, so I see global health practice um, uh, in the international research and capaci capacity building consortiums that we create. Um, but I think that global health is really still an aspiration. Um, and, and I think it's an organizational model for an integrated international network willing to help each other respond to emergencies. And to an extent, we see that. And to also an extent, we, we haven't, we, we, don't, we don't yet. So um, I, think I'll, I think I'll stop there. But I, I guess just the, the, the one big thing in terms of advances in re research methods and education is the insights from One Health and how that encourages us to think ecologically. And by ecologically, I don't mean just like as a branch of biology. I mean um, to think about complex systems, an organized complex of multiple actors, species, and specialists and the way that they interact with each other. And then that helps to bring global health itself into view as, as a complex ecosystem. Terrific. Thanks, Mel. And really, in addition to representing a generation, representing a whole new field of, of research. And, but I think really, when we're, you know, I think we like the 2009 definition, but you're really bringing in some, some new concepts that need to be included, that need to be added. So, so thank you for that. And so um, now to Allah, and you mentioned um, governance um, in your earlier remarks, but we have seen really substantial changes in global health governance, um, the emergence of the new global health threats, the reforms at WHO, um, increasing engagement of non-state actors, and new funding mechanisms such as the Global Fund and Gavi. And I have a confession, I generated that list using ChatGPT. Speaking of artificial <laughs> intelligence, you thought I had a brilliant, I validated the list from my own experience, but that's where it first came from. But really with your very vast experience at the ministerial level and at the WHO, how do you see these forces and governance changing global health? Uh, uh, I see three changes. Uh, one is that today we see more uh, Health, global health partners operating than maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And I think this is something that is positive because this very often provides uh, additional support. But the downside 
is when there are no clear roles, when there is competition, when there is lack of coordination, and when there is repetition. So I think this is uh, one of the critical issues in global health that needs to be uh, considered. The second change I see is, which may be related to the first change, uh, at least partly, is that the global health institutions that have a legitimate uh, uh, role in leading uh, global health, and by this I mean mainly WHO, has been compromised, and it is poorly funded, and it is not enabled to perform its function as uh, the a specialized agency of the United Nations that focuses on health and coordinates uh, global health. 30 or 40 years ago, uh, the situation was different in terms of funding. Today, um, if you look at the WHO funding and the WHO budget, you see that less than 20% of the WHO budget comes from flexible uh, assessed contributions from member states, enabling WHO to, of course, assign and to allocate resources to priorities. Uh, this was not the case 30 years ago. <laughs> uh, and as a result of this, because most of the funding that comes to WHO is highly earmarked and specified for certain priorities that actually are determined by the uh, uh, other global health partners that, that provide the funding. And what does that mean? It means that critical functions of WHO um, are not receiving uh, the, at least the minimum um, amount of funding to enable WHO to function at the, at the not only at the global level in terms of normative function, for normative functions, but also the technical collaboration, which is, I think, one of the most critical uh, problems that we face today in low-income countries and lower middle-income countries, the need for um, uh, a more effective uh, model of technical collaboration with countries. And the WHO is the agency that should be providing it together with the uh, other um, uh, institution. And I think the third change is the shift that we see today uh, in terms of governance uh, from it's something that I mentioned before from the World Health Assembly uh, into you know, the General Assembly of the United Nations, from meetings and policy making at the level of ministers of health to uh, policy making at the level of the heads of states and government. And that is good too. Uh, uh, I mean, it started with HIV AIDS in 2001 with the high-level meeting, and then the second one, 10 years later, 2011, with non-communicable diseases. I was privileged to actually coordinate um, the preparations for the uh, General Assembly meeting on NCDs. And then, but since then, there is an increasing number of health problems that are being addressed at the United Nations. Today, this year, I mean, this yeah. year we have three. And, and so we have uh, a high-level meeting on tuberculosis. We have a high-level meeting on emergency preparedness and response and talking about um, some maybe uh, new initiatives on how uh, emergency preparedness and response should be managed at the global level. Uh, and we also have a high-level meeting on universal health coverage for the second time since 2019. So that's, uh, that's something that is very positive because many of the global health challenges that we actually face today are multi-sectoral. And, and, and the solutions are basically multi-sectoral. I mean, today when you look at the best buys in, in, in public health, many of them are multi-sectoral. Um, and so it's good that these issues are addressed by, you know, at the level of heads uh, of states and government. But this has not been really, I mean, there are a number of examples where these high-level meetings were not properly followed up. And so you have a very long 
kind of report, which is called a political declaration or an outcome document, 13 pages, 14 pages, and then there's no adequate follow-up, and there is no significant progress. So I think there is a, a, the, a, a need for, uh, for, for the global health, the key global health uh, partners to reconsider how these high-level meetings, how the heads of states meeting can be actually modified to bring uh, the desired uh, change. So basically, I think these are the three key changes that I currently see in relation to the global health um, uh, governance. I, I, not only because of my background in the WHO, uh, but uh, I, I firmly believe that one of the most urgent issues today is to strengthen WHO and to enable WHO to perform its role, both at the normative functions and also the technical collaboration with countries. Thank you, really key insights. And it seems like kind of a vicious cycle that the more these other actors are empowered, that the less uh, leadership or power there is with, with WHO, including with the heads of state as another sort of competing uh, voices. So I'm gonna turn things over now to Judy to, to bring us home. Thanks, Peter. We're not quite at the bring it home stage, but um, th this next round um, of questions really focuses on, okay, so what does all of this mean? What are the implications um, for this new conceptualization of global health? And actually, in the last round that you just led, Peter, we, we kind of touched on several of these issues, and particularly because we're running about 15 minutes late, and I want to make sure we have time for you all to ask questions and add your comments. Um, I'm, I'm going to, rather than asking each of you in turn a question, I'm going to throw out a couple of questions, and whatever you want to respond to is great. Um, if there are any more thoughts about the implications for global health practice, changes in global health practice, research, education, or training, which you've all touched on. Please feel free to talk about that or health systems. I, but I also want to be sure that somebody talks about the implications for two other things. One is changes in the way we fund or support global health. What are the implications for that? How should um, global health actions be supported? Do the roles of international agencies and national governments need to change? Um, how can we, or can we, pre-position human and financial resources, particularly for emergencies? How should we think differently about that? So that's one set of questions. And then the other, since we're at CUGH, is what changes should university programs uh, begin to make to better support all the things we've talked about, this, this more refined or reimagined vision of global health? How could we um, do a better job of preparing people, um, both in high-income countries and in low- and middle-income countries, to work in this field? Who wants to lead off? Tommy, great, thank you. I think the answer would, you know, focus on at three levels. One is at the national government level, then institutions you talked about, and then finally, I would also talk about international agencies. When we talk about national governments, we find that in many of the cases, national governments, they aren't yet prepared to take up global health. So there's a great need to make the national governments aware about global health as it is today. How can that be done? That can be done by increasing awareness. And that again rests upon largely the institutions, the universities. If you look at the courses that are offered by the universities on global health, on public health, much of that is, you know, theoretical, classroom-based. I think this has to, you know, shift from largely classroom-based to, you know, 
practicum to feel based you know students it's now time that students they need to know about country case studies about country analysis they also need to know when they graduate and they start their work how can they impress upon governments government officials how can they impress upon you know funding agencies so that the funding is increased and one last element that i would like to mention dr wasser height is that you know it is time that you know universities and other programs you know impart the education so that people can embrace the technology and just in one minute i want to give one last example the hospital that icddrb runs takes care of 160000 people every year free of cost and this is the largest diarrheal disease hospital in the world people do die so we were thinking about how we can further reduce the mortality so we did a study utilizing machine learning we thought that it would be acute malnutrition that would come at the top and we would have to take care of malnutrition but lo and behold it was creatinine kidney function that came at the top and now the hospital is trying to figure out how we can further reduce the mortality using the new knowledge acquired so that's what embracing technology is and we need to do this now thank you thank you um yes the icddrb hospital is quite quite something um but thank you for those comments more broadly takes me back actually to the time uh patty you looked like you wanted to say something and let's please keep comments short just so we can turn so you were talking about um finances okay mm -hmm. and actually this plenary was called i think you call it reimagining global health right so i think we need to reimagine also global health finance okay so there is a need of and and at the highest level we need to think how to be more efficient and fragmentation is one issue that needs to be addressed um probably is not in in the area of the universities to do this but this is something that it's part of of a pending a uh, issue the the second thing reimagining he global health finances finances is i think we need to ask for more health for the money so efficiency okay and the third thing that was in a way mentioned earlier but one one of uh, the people that made comments after the debate that was really great by the way is that um there has to be ways and and i think there is a need of working together with local governments so um so uh, there has to be involvement of governments okay according to their needs um and there had had to be exit ex strategies for funding which is critical mm -hmm. and my last point we talk a lot about again i still think that we need to do a lot uh, for this term global health to be taken differently outside from high income countries mm -hmm. we need to but i i think a great example in africa on how regionally they are working issues that they have in common as a region and i think regional health okay for other regions like latin america i wish we could have a latin american cdc mm -hmm. like the one that africa has mm -hmm. okay because that could allow us to be more efficient have better responses share responsibilities capacities etc and eventually maybe have south to south collaboration between our cdcs because sometimes it feels okay it feels that is much more difficult when you have to do it with the north Great. stop there thank you mel short and sweet please yeah i think the question was on on the role of of research universities maybe move, moving forward yeah um and 
I want, I was thinking to encourage, this is something actually that you, Patty, uh, mentioned very explicitly at the very beginning um, that I just wanted to return to is, is the need for uh, structural and not only medical interventions. Um, I think this ties into something I really wanted to quickly bring up because it wasn't, hasn't been discussed in, the, in this conversation so far. We haven't talked about um, uh, the need to decolonize global health is the terminology that, that we're using. Um, but what that means basically is acknowledging how legacies of colonialism, of, of neo-colonialism, and, and of neoliberalism are present today in dynamics of knowledge transfer and the directionality of capacity building uh, and funding dependencies, how, how these inequalities are structural. And what that means is that they were constructed deliberately to be there. So inequalities are deliberate. <laughs> and if we're going to undermine them or, un or, or minimize them, I think the place to do that is vis-a-vis is, uh, -vis structural interventions beyond the, uh, the, the sector of health alone. And the reason just, just that I said that um, maybe there's a role for universities in playing this is because I can't really imagine um, a, a nation state uh, dismantling um, its structures, so. Um, Great comment, there. thank you. Ala, you can have the last word if you want it, or do you want to pass? <laughs> Very briefly, though, about please. The time, so, okay, yeah, all right, but it's up to you. It's, there's one thing that, uh, there's one thing that we did not really uh, uh, mention, and this is in relation to your question, and this is the role of research in global health, which I think is, is critical, and it's related to one of the um, uh, critical problems or challenges that we have, and we, we mentioned before, I think more than one, one has mentioned this, and, 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 and the point I want to raise is the critical importance of implementation research and implementation science in, uh, in, 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 in global health. And, and mentioning this, I must say that I'm one of the people who have been extremely enthusiastic about implementation uh, research and science because I see that there are so many issues that policymakers are struggling with that really require this kind of, of research. So we give recommendations, um, uh, you know, as global health uh, institutions, and we think that you know countries and policymakers will take it and run with it, and that doesn't happen because the know-how is not there, mm -hmm. and implementation. And so one thing that I worry about is that I would like to see more implementation science research taking place in collaboration with countries, mm -hmm. with ministries of health, and not as academic kind of you know, activity, and we saw so many, you know, global health institutions in the north that are working in a number of low-income countries and lower-middle-income countries, but we have not seen, you know, uh, uh, many examples of uh, this having a, a, an impact, a major impact on, you know, moving things forward mm -hmm. in, uh, in the challenges that policymakers are struggling with. Thank you so much for that. And certainly, we've, I think you're seeing that with the implementation of the disease control priorities. And polio eradication is another great example of that. All right, finally, you all have been incredibly patient. I would love to have uh, any. <laughs> great, good. Um, we're going to take a series of questions and comments. Please keep them short so we can get to as many people as possible. Um, and please introduce yourself very briefly. All right, uh, thank you so much. We're going to start in the center here, mm -hmm. and then we're going to go there, and then we're going to go here. So let's start in the center, please. OK, yes. Um, I am Bernard Usu, um, a doctoral student in the Global Infectious Diseases at Georgetown um, University, and also at the um, Center for <coughs> Global Health Science and Security at Georgetown. Um, I just want to take um, some point at Tamid. Um, 
where you said one of the key defining points of global health is um, that the event must transcend um, borders. I respectfully disagree in that um, global health can be local. And I'll cite an example in Nigeria, as um, was earlier elucidated, that in 2017, um, through robust um, surveillance systems, doctors were able to detect and also sound alarm on this uh, monkeypox, but nothing was done, irrespective of the fact that we had medical countermeasures in the global north. Nothing was done until five years later when cases started emerging in the global north and, oh, now let's declare fake. Let's do this, that. At what cost? Over 80,000 um, cases and more than 100 case fatalities. This is something that could have been addressed at the source, and that is global health made local. My take on this um, so far will be going forward, as we want to re-image um, global health, we should elevate the conversation to the stage where health or health-related events, irrespective of any country, should receive equal um, attention. So for instance, if there is Malaria in Congo, and WHO and all the health steering committees can openly discuss it. Then if there are pertinent health issues in the global north, any country in the global north, it should also be brought to the table for open discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, over uh, on that side, please. Yes, thank you. Ijiama Nodimopara, Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit and also rep in Nigeria. Thank you for an excellent discussion. I really want to uh, bolster the point that Dr. Mel made around science being political and at the very top and really lift that up uh, because uh, if we haven't learned that in these last three years, I don't know when we will learn it. But I just really want to lift up the fact that, you know, who is doing science and what science, the funding, the resources are are given, where that science is done and experienced, who is in the position to make the decisions, who is not in the position, who is not, who, or whose science is not called science, who is not considered an expert, and who is, all these things are political. And there's no, organization, no, no group or entity that knows that more than minoritized, marginalized, and structurally excluded groups and communities all over the world who have also bear the brunt of the harms of said science, as well as healthcare and public health. They know, we know, that it is extremely political. So any statement or positionality that science is not or should not be political is one of extreme privilege. And it really should be named as such. I really want to lift that up. I also want to lift up again, silos are political. <laughs> and the silos in global health and science as well. Dr. Mel, I would love you to expand on your idea inside of language as we reimagine global health in the 21st century and how the language we use in global health is political. I want to name one of very many examples, high-income countries, low- and middle-income Who named these things and why? Language is political. Where these languages come from, who defines them, how it's used is, for, is in service for a purpose. What is the functionality of these terms and languages? What if we started to redefine countries according to their debt load, not their income load? And so what would it look like to talk about high debt countries and low debt countries? Where would the United States rank in that case? And what will resources be given to the United States or vice versa? What if we started talking about countries according to their level of firearm fatality, their level of maternal health fatality, their levels of police brutality, low communality countries, etc. So talk, talking through how the very language we use in global health serves to perpetuate these inequities and inequalities themselves, the, hegem the hegemonies themselves inside and outside of the field, I believe is critical as we reimagine global health in the 21st, 22nd, or 30th century. Thanks. Thank you so much. We're, we're, we're going to take a series of questions, and then we'd love your comments. All right. I think I saw Roger on this yeah. side. Roger. <clears throat> yeah. You know, before the pandemic, you need to introduce yourself. Uh, Roger Glass, uh, yeah. formerly with Voting. Just in case. <clears throat> 
Be before the pandemic, we were working on an active program with the Wellcome Trust, Gates, and NIH to have governments increase their spend in the global health arena for health and for uh, wellness and, and for research. When the pandemic came, we said, gosh, no great disaster goes without a, a there's an opportunity there. And subsequently, every government was affected by the pandemic by not having the detection methods and the structure. Uh, and I, my question when I thought about reimagining global health would be that following the pandemic, all of these governments would rush to fill in those absences that made them vulnerable. I haven't heard that in the presentations. And I think, have we lost an opportunity or is that opportunity still out there? So I'll leave the panel with that question. Thank you. Great question. Quentin, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Uh, Introduce yourself. Yeah. Quentin, Quentin Eichbaum, Vanderbilt University. So I want to build on the question of politics, but there's a slight wrinkle on it. Earlier in the debate this morning, Dr. Sukat was adamant that we should separate out the political from the apolitical, and the WHO should have two wings. And I think this is one of the most interesting parts that have come out of this debate. That isn't in the original definition, although it's implicit, improving is a word then, achieving is in the definition. But I'd like to hear the panel's view on this really important point, because we're dealing with agencies like WHO, USAID, the World Health Forum. These are highly political bodies. To what extent should we do more to train our s scientists and global health advocates to be more politically effective? Thank you. I think that's part All right. Please. Hi. Thank you very much. This is uh, Nuhu Amin from ICDDRB, and I'm also a PhD student from University of Technology, Sydney. And my question is about uh, on sustainable uh, scientific uh, development of local scientists uh, at the local level and how can we keep the scientists at the local level because I work at ICDDRB more than 10 years and uh, more than 50 scientists leave Bangladesh and serving other countries, like mostly developed countries. And uh, the gap is here, like every, every like we train the uh, local scientists and they actually come to uh, developed countries and serve that country. It's not due to like better opportunity, but also uh, d due to the lack of resources over there. So is there any policy in the future that we can like keep it, uh, keep the, local scientists and make the local scientists locally and also like train them over there by uh, continuous and sustainable funding over there. And this question could be like to like Patrika or uh, uh, any, any of the panelists. And, and there are lots of issues, you know, happening due to the shifting that locally the cha like champion are not uh, developing over there. So uh, um, and that's a very uh, question from my side. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Michelle. Um, hi, Michelle Berry, um, Stanford. Um, so the original article, Judy, that the Lancet article was a great article talking about global health as really an issue for equity, um, a moral compass for equity. But I, I'd love to think about reimagining global health and introduce um, this concept of global sovereignty um, that really, we're really in a red alert now for issues that cross boundaries, whether arguably, I think the biggest global health problem now is climate. Um, Patty, I have to say, you can't have a thriving human being if, unless you have a thriving planet. It has nothing to do with aliens. Um, I, I think it is the looming problem that we have now. But if you think about other problems, antimicrobial resistance, pollution, um, global workforce, they all cross borders. So I would love to see a rediscussion if we start reimagining global health um, on this concept of global sovereignty. Thank you. All right, we're just going to take these remaining people um, questions. I hope the panel is ready to charge through these. Please. 
Hi, this is Yang Mu Huang from Peking University, China. And I flew 24 hours here just to show you that we are now still doing Global House in China, and we all want to do Global House together with you all. So um, actually, during the past three years, uh, we have uh, the university teaching Global House in China have uh, grown from 10 universities to more than 17 universities. And my question is related to multilateral, multi-sectoral, and multidisciplinary, also multinational collaboration. You mentioned about South-South collaboration. I mean, uh, it had been brought up for many years, but now still it's more about North-South uh, collaboration. So what do, what's your opinion about how emerging countries, or more sensitively, how China or other South uh, collaborations can be done more in the future of Global House? And I also want to add a comment about politics and Global House government, how it is important. As a Chinese delegation, I went to World House Assembly and Equitable Board every year. Um, so I can witness how World House Assembly have been more political than ever. A lot of technical um, issues have been uh, decided to be a more political discussion. So what do we see about that and how we can do about it? In the past, it's more about global governance for, for health, but sometimes now I think it's health for global governance. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi, uh, I'm Shireen. I'm uh, based in Scotland. I'm a virologist. Uh, and I've always struggled with the terminology of global north and global south because having Australia and the global north just kind of messes with my head. So hopefully my question is something that actually applies to applies pretty globally. So increasing life expectancy in the in the last few years has uh, or in the last couple of decades has been the major one of the major feats of modern medicine, uh, which is great. Um, but this is expected to continue over the next decade or so, even more. Um, and with that comes the burden of NCDs and other sort of chronic and geriatric issues, um, and possibly even sort of infectious diseases. Um, and our systems to kind of manage these problems has not evolved at the same rate as, as the research around this, these problems. Um, and I just wanted to know what is your sort of outlook on how this is going to continue in the future, whether it's like uh, on the social aspect or, or the medical aspect, um, and especially in sort of health management and in terms of research funding. So this is kind of slightly different from health equity and stuff. Um, I just have one other question comment which kind of follows on about science and politics, which I'm glad a couple of other people picked up. Uh, and I feel like as scientists, uh, because we're so dependent on public funding, uh, we're almost kind of conditioned to hold back our voices uh, a lot of times. I, uh, I'm going to ask you to come to a very short question because we have a few other people and we're actually already over. So yep, just, just ending. frame your question. Yeah, so Please. just do we need to change the fundamental way that sort of R&D and health systems work in terms of whether we should be focusing on research outputs in terms of just publications or something else, uh, which kind of reduces our dependency on charities for solving some of the most important health problems uh, and being more self-sufficient and possibly more aggressive. Great. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, all right. Last question over here, please. Hi, my name is Sarah Dennison Johnston. I'm with the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Um, and I'm also a uh, young person with an anthropology background, so thank you, Dr. Mel, for representing us so well. Um, also, as a young person, uh, I'm gonna put my activist hat on. I feel like I've listened a lot to how important lived experience is um, and how sometimes it's even more important and more expert than medical or technical experience. Um, and especially global health, so many, of our, so many of our wins are really on the backs of community health workers with their lived expertise of, a, of their lifelong experience in their bodies with their health, with their care. How do we make sure that, they're part of, that those perspectives are part of this conversation as we're discussing reimagining global health when they're really the backbone? Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, Very yes. short. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew Kimberly, uh, I'm with the CUGH co-chair at Tech, and I just wonder if we're being impractical, possibly being unreasonable by maybe going down this same path that we've done for so long to expect 
institutions or governments to make the significant cha uh, changes mentioned, uh, especially when we're talking about structural inequality, as uh, Melissa said. I, I think these institutions are by nature conservative. And uh, I mean, when we're talking about uh, we can't trust the governments to do it, then maybe we should look at institutions um, when they can't even meaningfully address the issue of, say, student debt, right? And um, anyone who has dealt with an institution knows, uh, like, with when an institution has an irrational issue, document, uh, requirement that affects the individual, affects a small group, how unlikely that organization is to admit any kind of wrongdoing or even some sort of uh, inadequacy in that issue. And therefore, uh, you know, nothing gets really done. So um, maybe the question is, can institutions actually change and are we being overly optimistic, something like that? Well, and I think uh, to go, I'm sorry to take up time, I know, but uh, we've talked about going into the 21st century, but I don't think we really addressed technology uh, significantly, which is obviously going to be such an important aspect when we look at WhatsApp, social media, and their abilities to connect groups uh, that are disenfranchised, minority franchises, um, minority groups to get the health care that they need or, or the translations that they need, to, the connections that they need uh, to do whatever it is in health, law, engineering. Uh, city planning and so on and so forth. And I think that um, to make it, uh, to finalize, uh, I think what Melissa said about decentering the human is one of the most profound things that was said here, and I wanted to uplift that because, okay. uh, yes, uh, quickly, just because um, when we're looking I at all these systems, how complex they are, Right, we're talking about very complex situations and we can't even agree on what the definition of global health is and we're trying to find solutions to that and that maybe AI might be the future of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last comment over there and then here, but again, we're way over, so please, very short. I, Thank you. I'm gonna keep this extremely short. So um, my name is Lindsay Martin. I'm a uh, nurse practitioner. I'm also the director of uh, the disaster response team at Mass General Hospital. And um, in terms of reimagining global health, I have a very simple question, which is where are the nurses? I, I see. Uh, yeah, we. Uh, this is my second major global health conference in a week, and the representation of nursing is is low. And I think that we need to increase opportunity for nursing because we're over 50% of the global health workforce. And inherent in that is a hierarchy within global health that sort of prepositions physicians in leadership positions and keeps us doing the work. So I think I would like to reimagine global health as a place where nurses have a place at the table. Great. Thank you for that. And last but not least. Uh, uh, Jawad Noon from uh, University of Gottingen in Germany. Uh, Professor Garcia talked about the tension between global health program and the public health program at the university, and I'll make things a bit more complicated. Uh, for instance, at my alma mater at the University of Oxford in the UK, we have two master's program, one in master's of global health and master's of international health. Um, so uh, my point is, like, in order to define global health, isn't it more important to also define international health, population health, and public health so that we can demarcate between all these um, and also, who came up with the de definition of public health? And what is the process of universe or getting a definition universally accepted across board? And how did that happen for public health, for instance? Okay. Thank Thanks. you. So, Allah, I'm going to turn to you first, because as I understand it, there's an airport that's calling you. Um, so any of the questions to which you'd like to respond, please go for it. And we have So thank you so much, Judy, and I, I apologize for having to leave uh, uh, a little bit early. Uh, 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 
I can, you know, I, I was very much interested in hearing what Roger was uh, asking because I knew he was talking about emergency preparedness and, and pandemic preparedness, and, but the sound was not very clear, actually. So I asked my colleague here to, uh, to, uh, to whether she has heard it, and she gave me the impression that you were actually talking about or, or asking about the state of preparedness. Uh, for, 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 for countries um, uh, in this area. And, and, and I think this is uh, something that we did not really discuss because uh, in, my, um, uh, in my response to Judy's first question, I said there's one thing that we have to return in global health and give it a, a higher level of priority. And this is the issue of emergency preparedness and response. Uh, I remember, you know, we had the, the joint external evaluation developed and by, uh, I think, uh, uh, January 2020, the beginning of the pandemic, there were about over 100 countries that have actually conducted the joint external evaluation, the JEE. Uh, but when you look actually at what, uh, what, what, uh, what countries did, the vast majority of them did not have a plan which is financed. And those countries that started doing this kind of evaluation on their preparedness and IHR competencies, um, they, uh, of all these countries that have developed the plan, very, very few were actually financed. And I wonder, I mean, we don't have a survey now of, uh, you know, on how many countries are, are fully prepared after the huge lessons that we have learned from the pandemic. But my, own, my guess is that we are nowhere to being prepared. And so that is a, one of the most critical issues. I'm just highlighting what I said at the beginning, that this is, we don't seem to have learned enough from, uh, from, from, from the pandemic. So this is an area of, I think, uh, the highest priority for, for global health. And the second uh, interesting question was on uh, whether we should train our global health leaders or global health professionals on political skills. I think this is, this is how I uh, understood the question. And I think it is very important because one of the problems that we currently face is that, as I said before, that in many low and middle income countries, we do not really have the skills with policy makers or with decision makers in negotiations, in, in being engaged in, uh, in, in policy making and decision making uh, in relation to global health policies. Uh, and, and this is critical. And one, one basic uh, problem that we currently have is that there is no coordination between the health sector in a country and the foreign policy sector. And increasingly today, many of the global health decisions are made actually uh, either, I mean, in New York and by heads of states, particularly for problems like emergency preparedness and, and, and response. And although there are brilliant diplomats in New York in their own missions, who are really conducting this kind of negotiations very well, they don't have a clear understanding of some of the critical health policy issues. And so this kind of you know, lack of coordination within the country between foreign policy and health is something that deserves, um, 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 I think, more attention. And, and, and I think this is something that requires leadership training for policy makers or decision makers, and also training and skills in health diplomacy. We don't see this happening, I think, in, 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 in many countries. And I think this is one of the critical functions of the global health institutions, including uh, WHO, that we should, we should have more and more of this kind of uh, you know, training in political skills, particularly th through health diplomacy. Thank you. Great. Really important points there. Other comments? We had a wonderful set of questions here. Um, yeah, Patty, go for it. Well, first of all, 
I agree with all the comments. I mean, there have been really great comments, and um, I got um, a few things that I would like to mention. So I think, Roger, you were asking about this issue of, I mean, governments might not have learned from what has happened. So there was a session in which we talk about the pandemic treaty or the pandemic accord. Um, so for the ones that don't know about it, it will be important for us, for all of us, and that's one issue. I mean, this is a legally binding document that is being discussed at the highest level at the WHO, which um, should guide n not only emergency response, but prevention, and ideally prevention at source in countries uh, in order to have better for the future pandemics be better prepared. And especially because we don't believe in solidarity, because solidarity didn't, does not exist. And, um, and as with other issues like nuclear bombs, uh, there are things that can be done or not. And uh, there are accountability issues, incentives or disincentives. So I think this pandemic treaty or pandemic accord, you can find it in the website and it's in several languages. Right now, the, the, this draft zero is being discussed. Um, some people don't have much hope. I have hope because I never thought we were going to reach the point in which these issues were going to be discussed. Um, I really love um, um, the, somebody brought the issue of global sustainable scientific development. And I think this, this is something that probably might be the name of a new program for Fogarty. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, because going forward, what we have seen is that there is a need of investing in local capacity building. And local capacity building should, uh, should consider even basic science at the level of our countries, because as we have seen, there, I mean, we need development that could respond to the needs that we have, but we need development also that could be close to where it's needed. So building capacity, research capacity, and then training on all those different things that analysis, statistical issues, clinical trials, um, involvement of communities, social sciences. I mean, all those things are very much needed. And I really love this idea. I mean, how can we create uh, equitable knowledge and capacities in research. And also, what we have seen, we have had a lot of trouble with regulations uh, during COVID, and uh, that's another issue that needs to be addressed. And there were um, lots of, uh, of issues. I think nurses, I mean, it's not only a matter of involving nurses, and, and, and I think we were talking about health providers in general. I think we need all the disciplines. And that's what I was saying. I would like architects to be sitting here. We need to be more transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary. And um, my last comment is um, that, well, two last comments. One, I hate when people said global south and global north. Isn't that an oxymoron? If it is global, why it should be south or north? But we still use those terms. And my last thing is that I completely, completely agree that we all, and that's part of what needs to be done through universities, we need to teach how to navigate the political space at the minimum, okay? It will be great if several of us end up accepting being ministers of health. Okay, I got all my white hair from being minister of health, but I know for sure that I have a space in heaven already waiting for me, okay? so. We need more people, and universities are training people that eventually may get in those positions. So we need to take that seriously because it's part of, if, if we do great science and that doesn't go into policy or implementation, we have done nothing. Thank you. All right. Um, we are way over, but a couple of closing short comments. Mel, a lot of your comments resonated very strongly with, yeah. with folks. If you turn it on, the, the, this, if this you start on, talking, this one's good. Okay, thank on. you, thank you. 
Um, thank, thank you. Okay. Um, just qu some quick questions. Yeah, I'll please. try to be quick. Um, yeah. To the comment about language, 100% yes. Um, one's position, I think that one's positionality in the global system and their lived subjective experiences influences the language. And I actually have some uh, da data to back this up. Um, I did a study comparing North American and Latin American researchers' definitions and conceptualizations of global health um, and found that um, among, among many things, but when North American researchers um, were defined global, the global, they talked about, it, they talked about worldwide transnational um, uh, diseases, but they also t referred to it as like a, the system, a system for organizing nation states into, let me, start, let me try that again. They said, they said it was transnational and worldwide and it had to do with uh, you know, diseases that could happen anywhere despite their incomes. So in other words, what they're conceptualizing is a global system where nation states can be organized into it according to their income uh, level. That's one way of thinking. Um, and then the Latin American uh, researchers talked about the complexity, the political, economic, and social complexities, uh, and their language highlighted how like finances and funding and, and neoliberalism are kind of present a counter logic to equity. They even talked about how like um, <laughs> the, the the structural adjustment programs to defund health infrastructures uh, in the uh, in the eighties, all the way up into the eighties and nineties. Uh, to defund social medicine. Um, basically, the, these, uh, so the ethic of equity, the idea that health is for all, is now being repackaged under the name of global health, but it had already existed there in other forms, uh, in other ideologies. Um, I just wanted to also say about preparedness, um, Something that I think about, though, in the is in the United States, there seems to be an obsession still with like figuring out the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the rhetoric around that is we have to identify the uh, origins of this one so that we can prevent the next one, and we just keep saying that. In order to prevent, we need to figure out where this one came from so we can prevent the next one, and I, I, I don't know if, how? How is that? I don't know if that's true, meanwhile, I mean, there are important reasons to, you know, scientifically, but mostly geopolitically, I think, um, to to search for the origins of COVID-19. But if the goal, or of SARS-CoV-2, but if the goal is to prevent the next pandemic, like, why are we not screaming into a microphone like we're the H5N1 mammal to mammal transmission in Peru but, uh, between sea lions. Like that is a huge biosecurity threat with pandemic potential that we're not really emphasizing. Um, so I don't know, I think that, I hope that this conversation uh, can actually help us critically look at pandemic preparedness and the narratives and the kind of under-examined rhetorics that underpin it today, and maybe we can even reimagine global health pandemic preparedness for the 21st century in light of some of the conversations that we had today. Uh, there, I'll stop there. Thank you. Great comments. Hamid, do you want to add anything? Uh, very, very briefly, uh, global health, the way we are reimagining it, will require specific skills, will require specific competencies. But unfortunately, in many countries today, even if you want to do a simple survey, you need to bring in a consultant from another country. So this is the state of affairs, and that's why we need lots of capacity building. Unfortunately, we didn't talk much about it, but this is what we need now. The issue of attrition came up, but I think that's inevitable. Either we have to provide the environment or create the opportunities by which people who are trained, they stay back, okay? But even if that is not happening, that should not deter us from taking initiatives to go for capacity development. That's an imperative and that we have to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
So Maureen, uh, don't kill me that we've run over so much, um, but why don't you close this out, please? And so to remedy all this and the, the loss of time and to go to other very important sessions, I'm going to leave you with not, around, not another round of panel responses, but with 10 observations. So here we go. One, to do whatever we call it, global health or health or global, we must engage. Two, we must collaborate. And to collaborate, uh, we must engage. So it's, it's a prerequisite there. Three, we must infest. But the issue is, what do we infest in? Who infests? And how is that investment happening? Four, and Patty brought us there, the asymmetry of power. So who decides? Five, um, is global health just an organizational model with which we, are, which we use to implement health issues, as, as uh, Mel told us? Six, is global health, is emergency preparedness essential to global health? Is that what global health is all about? Seven, rather than talking, is, a, is the doing the part of global health? So therefore, is implementation science central to what global health is? Eight, is global health not so much talking about us humans, as Mel said, but talking about the social determinants, talking about animals, talking about one health? Nine, is global health about governments governance and link to that politics. And 10, and most importantly, who's going to do it? Not only people with health in their discipline or title, and what should they know? So with all those, um, we are taking the next step, and we are, all of us here on stage and so many others, is to make that, publish what we discussed today, um, and so many more manuscripts to come, but above all, to do the things we talked about today and make the changes. And you've been a fantastic audience. Thank you.